How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm so excited to talk to you about this. Me too. I'm so happy to be here. Wonderful. So um, let's talk about the fact that you're really at the helm of this and you were at the helm of it the first time. I heard. Yes. I think I watched a video uh, about you dragging a fence all around the country because you were sure that it was going to come up again, and then you almost didn't keep it. And then, mm -hmm. tell me that story again. Like, what, what what was the deal by that? So you had a you have the was a barbed wire fence from the original production. Yes, it would. The posts were made out of styrofoam, like painted styrofoam, and then there was wire. And um, after we did it, it went so well, and we got such great feedback from it we started getting this idea of, ooh, we could do this in New York. So we were all planning to move there in a few months anyway. Um, and then I just had this sense of, well, let's hang on to it. And so we rolled up the fence and then saran wrapped it so it would stay intact. And then um, Kira and Megan and I were all sharing a U-Haul up to New York. And so we just put it in the U-Haul. And then I had it in my apartment in Bushwick for like a year and a half. And it was one of the, I mean, it was my first apartment ever. It was so tiny. There were barely doors on it. And I had this big fence in the corner. Um, and I just held on to it. And then eventually Will moved up and he had a bigger apartment than me. So he then put it in his apartment for a little while. Um, and then both of us moved away from the city. And right before he moved, he called me up and said, you know, like, I think it's time to let go of the fence. <laughs> um, and I'd held up the costumes too. I had everything in a suitcase. And because I applied for the rights twice. So we applied when we first moved and they were on hold. And then I applied again, I think a year and a half later and they were still on hold. Um, what does that and, mean when the rights are on hold? I'm not familiar with the process. I, I don't entirely understand it, but I think what I think happened is Martin Sherman had a new play gently down the stream at the public. And so I feel like they kind of put a hold on Martin Sherman plays in the area. I don't know exactly why um, Samuel French didn't um, share that much information, um, but essentially that there's a theater that's interested in the project or interested in something by that playwright. And so they put a hold on the rights. Gotcha. Um, and so that was a bummer, but uh, eventually I just kind of let it go and was like, okay, you know, like we really tried to make this happen, you know, maybe it wasn't meant to happen. So we really let the dream go. And then I moved to Atlanta. Um, and then just a few months before moving back, I was just kind of hungry for a project. And then I thought, ooh, I wonder if the rights are available, just kind of on a whim. And they were, and I found out really, really quickly. Uh, and then I was like, well, I guess I'm moving to New York. And I called everybody up and said, do you want to do Ben's again in New York? And what was their reaction? Uh, they were like, yes. Especially Michael Calciano was like, immediately, yes. And Will, at the time, I think at this point, he was already in San Diego. And mm -hmm. so he was like, yes, I want to. I'm not sure how I'll get there and if I can get there, but I want to. Um, and Josh, yeah. Um, so those three like immediately jumped in. Um, and yeah. That's awesome. That's so exciting <laughs> that you were able to get it all together, even if, though it took time to get all the pieces kind of in the right place. Um, totally. Let's back up a little bit and talk about the, uh, the why here, why now, right? Like that's the big question anytime you do theater is like you're restaging something that already happened somewhere. And in this case, you're restaging a show you already staged. So um, wh what played into that the first time? And then what what really, other than still having, you know, do you still have the fence? No, no. <laughs> oh, so sad. We threw it away. I uh, know, we'll throw it away. Because that was have... the like, all right, it's time to like. Right. <laughs> But despite the fact that you released it, you know, in, in uh, lack of a better term, uh, it still came upon you to be like, I want to do this again. So so walk me through that with the first time. Like what inspired you in 2015 or really 2014, I guess, to get, yeah. start rolling the ball on it? And then what what is it about this that we were like, let's do it again? Like we got to. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2014, um, Carl Forsman, the dean at the time, uh, decided to create keys to the kingdom right. i can't remember if it was called keys to the kingdom when they did it i know it was inspired by something that was happening when peter hedges was there mm -hmm. um which was like the student produced series people could write stuff direct stuff on their own and he gave us a theater to do it in and so i immediately knew i wanted to direct something right. i just wasn't sure what 
And then at the same time for intensive arts at the beginning of winter term, um, I don't know if they're still doing that, but they, for a little while they had it broken up into two different sections. And Carl had planned for us to all workshop plays that centered around the Holocaust. Um, and so then that got my wheels turning because I was thinking, I think my time had already been designated to around there. And I kind of wanted to get to do one myself, but actually have it a fully realized production. Um, that is one so of the things that Carl did that absolutely confused the shit out of me. Like yeah. when he was like, let's come back from Christmas break in the dead of winter and study <laughs> the Holocaust. I was, maybe it was some kind of brilliant Ilya Kazan kind of shit to get you to feel it while you're learning. But man, yeah. I was like, that sounds like pretty rough. Of, of course, the breaking up of intensive arts in the first place after it had all been in December for so, so long was weird, too. So, you know, but uh, that that was definitely something that, that caught me kind of off guard. And I was like, what are they doing? Yeah. So, but you know, I guess I guess I get it. But here you are again doing it in the winter. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think part of it might have been Holocaust rem remembrance. Holocaust Remembrance Day was yesterday, right. and so I think there might have been that. I think there's a lot of that in January in general. Mm. Um, but it was the twenty seventh, yeah, I, mean, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, Kira was making a joke the other day of like apparently she and will were talking and he was like you guys do realize that we're all going to be together in the middle of winter in new york city working on a holocaust play right especially <laughs> after, especially after him and alex have been chilling in san diego you know I getting the know. sun yeah so it's kind of it's harsh but i don't know it's important but yeah i mean that's where the inspiration came from and i was talking to my dad actually just asking if he knew any plays that centered on the Holocaust that he liked. And he said, Ooh, there's actually this play bent. That's pretty awesome. You should check it out. And then the second I read it, it just really impacted me, impacted me. And I felt really inspired. And then I immediately thought of Will Bethman in the lead. I knew he had to play that part. Um, and then it all kind of fell together from there. What do you love about the show? Like I, I've already talked to so many people already at this point and expressed so much about what I like about it. So I'm not even going to say, uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 an amazing piece. I did see the 2015 uh, production uh, and I enjoyed it so much, uh, which is one of the reasons why when it popped up in my feed of like, hey, give us some money. I was like, you know what? Fucking yeah, I will. Because I liked that a lot. And if that's what they're doing. So hell yes. Um, and so for for you. What is it about this play that really resonates with you? What did you get from that first read and, and maybe has continued, you know, as you got it on its feet and ran a production and now you're getting it on its feet again? Like, what is it that calls out to you from this play that, that really lights you up? Mm, um, for me, it's the, the fear of loving and the vulnerability of loving. Um, it is a gay story, and I think it tells that part of history that's really, really important. Um, but more than that, I think what makes it a universal story is the fear of intimacy, the fear mm. of really being honest with somebody um, and being gentle. Um, Horse talks about that. He's like, be gentle with me. Um, and I feel like the main character, Max, starts out and he's super detached from himself. And I mean, he was raised with a father who sent his first love away. And I mean, I think that definitely wounds him from the beginning. And um, I feel like most of the play is him running away from people who really care about him and love him. And um, and kind of running away from himself. There's a lot of self-hatred. There's a lot of um, just kind of... Um, there's a lot of lines he says where it's like, um, queers aren't meant to love and um, like I just feel responsible I'm a grown up now um, what's love kind of things like that that are very dismissive and um, and I feel like in the end he really opens up and allows himself to care about somebody um, which is hard I think it's hard for everybody to know that none of us get out of this life alive and so it's a risk you know, um, no matter what, loving someone's a risk because something could happen to them. And um, in this case, the stakes are extremely high. Yeah. Um, and then something does happen and um, he goes through so much loss. But um, but then the strength of like how how much survival do you have to go through to realize what the point of living is? And I think Max is really good at surviving. Um, but in the end, he's like, 
it's better to die being truthful to who he is and really allowing himself to care about somebody than to stay living no matter what and just keep surviving. Um, so that, I guess that was a long winded answer. No, it's a great answer. <laughs> it's got that parallel right to like um, the crucible, right? Cause you get this opportunity at the end where they're like, if you'll just renounce everything you believe in, we'll let you live. And the guy's like, fuck that. I mean, he, yeah. at first he says yes, actually, but then yeah. he's like, it's not worth it. Like, it, yeah. it, it's not worth the most valuable thing I've ever experienced, which is my life. And and to sacrifice that for what I truly believe in, the integrity that I have in these values and love and, 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 and honesty, it's worth it. And when you take somebody on a journey like that for a couple of hours and then a character makes a choice between those two things – and chooses that. I, I think that's one of the things that really stayed with me about this play and 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 really, man, I, I've thought about it since then. I'm like, man, this is, I also had, I mentioned this before, we were assigned this play in DMP when I was in the design courses. Yeah, okay. So when we had to make a ground plan and build a model and do all of that shit from a play that we hadn't seen in this case, uh, and just take it from the script and build a whole... I've never done that. I mean, even when I was directing, I often was like, maybe I read it one time. I needed to hear it. Like, I need I need to be in the space making it before I even understand what the fuck it is. But in this case, they were like, no, you have to realize the full set and find a way to utilize Kataba and very little shit to, like, make a set. And when I read the play then and then put it together, the different designs that came up in our class for the same play like blew my mind and so when I went into RJR to see this I had already envisioned it so many different ways and because you're in RJR you had to strip it all down to the most absolutely simplistic things that you could you know a bench a box the rocks whatever the fence it's like that's all you have and so I really got to see the play come to life as you know that's it there's nothing else helping tell the story really Um, And and I say that to say it really – this play, both when I worked on it as a designer in class and then saw it as an audience member, went into my director brain and was like turning all the right gears, you know? And so that's my transition to ask you. You were not in the directing program. You graduated as an actor. You're a very talented actor. I've seen you do it. What What drew you to directing when you were in school? How much have you done it since you left school? How is that factor into how you think of yourself as an artist, the director side? Yeah, um, I directed for the first time senior year of high school. Um, I directed Godspell, and I actually worked with Noah Birch, who's doing costumes for Bent, and it's been really fun working with him again. That's full circle. Um, Yeah, uh, and I really fell in love with it there. I mean, I've done little stuff, like um, I would help doing like this kids musical theater camp in the summer and um, like little skits and stuff. Yeah, I did that too. Um, Yeah. (laughs) That's so fun. Um, It's so fun, yeah. And so I've always kind of, uh, I I like seeing things from the outside and um, I like choreographed some pieces for intensive arts and things like that. Um, But this was the first straight play I've ever um, Mm. directed. And um, I don't know, I, it's funny, I don't get inspired to direct very often, but it seems about every few years, I just kind of need to do it. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm starting to get more interested in directing in general. Um, I'm getting, I don't know, I get a lot of joy from it. I really like collaborating with so many different people and seeing what everybody brings to the table, especially in terms of... Um, like the production side and the movement side, like it's been really great working with Ethan again. Um, and yeah, I feel like I like directing because I am an actor. And so um, I kind of know, at least for me, what's helpful as a director. Um, and uh, like, I, I don't know, I love getting in the heads of the characters and mm-hmm. trying to inspire if I like it to feel really real for people. And um like even with Rudy with the plants, like he's gonna go and buy the plants himself, and like I'll let him have that relationship. And um, I really like a collaborative process. I like people to feel like they that this this play belongs to everybody working on it. Right. No, I love that mentality, and especially with something as intimate as this story. You know, it's not you can't take it with you. <laughs> you know, it's not. Uh, you know, it's not a farce. It's it's it has an intimacy that 
is built on subtlety. And that's one of the things I really love about this play, which I'd also imagine makes it di- like difficult to fucking direct because the moments that you're trying to finesse and find, you know, uh, for those who are not familiar with the play, there are long scenes where the characters are communicating in an unconventional way because they're not allowed to fucking talk to each other. And, yeah. but yet we're on stage with them, you know, so to speak, and we're watching them try to find ways to communicate when they can't talk they can't touch each other they can't you know and yet they're falling in love and so to get in there in those little moments and really finesse what it sounds like is very important to you which is a deeply personal connection to the material how do you go about that like what what is your process for working with these guys on on this really subtle stuff yeah um it I'm very, very lucky in that Will and Josh are just really talented and amazing. And so, um, honestly, the stuff, those scenes in particular are coming together really nicely because they're both just coming super prepared and already are personalizing everything and are right. very emotionally right. available. Um, so that's a big part, I think, of just getting the two of them connected. Um, but they're both just doing a really good job of... Um, bringing everything, each rehearsal, and just being really open and really listening to each other. I've noticed that's the biggest thing in those scenes, um, is just remembering to breathe (laughs) and to keep talking and to listen. And I feel like I've also found with this play, because it's so well written, that my job is fairly easy. Interesting. Um, Like... All you have to do is say the words and keep breathing. <laughs> like, yeah. yes, there's other stuff, and yes, there's you know stage pictures and moments and stuff. But for the most part, I feel like Martin Sherman really takes care of the work for us, because um, everything is in the text. Well, every book about directing starts with the exact same piece of advice, and the number changes, but the advice is the same, which is eighty percent, which is the number I'm going to pull out of my ass, of the job when you're a director is casting. Put yeah. the right fucking people in the parts <laughs> and then get the fuck out of the way. Yeah. And then clean it up when stuff doesn't work. Like in an ideal world, that's what staging and directing a play should be like. And, you know, I felt like at least for myself when I was doing stuff at school or, or after the fact, almost everything I've ever done that gets really good feedback, I almost feel like I can't take any credit for it <laughs> because I'm like... You know, they're like, man, that was great. And I'm like, yeah, aren't they? You know, yeah. like you just yeah. don't. I, I have never <laughs> been on opening night of a show that I'm truly proud of and felt almost any ownership of it. Like, yeah. I don't know if you have that experience at all as well. Uh, and it's OK if you don't. If you do still <laughs> feel ownership, you can admit it. But uh, there's there's just something to me about when you're working with truly talented people. The second that you're running the show and you're no longer in rehearsals, it's like it's theirs. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it, they they own it. Yeah, I feel that way. I mean, um, I I never feel like I never like feeling like I'm like this is my play and I'm in charge. You know, like I just sure. feel, I'm not just in that kind of a process. Um, except I mean, with I, fundraising, I, right? Because you got to feel that um, way when except for with fundraising, because in that context, you got to be like, oh, I'm doing this play and it's mine and it's going to be good. And please give me the money. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah for I mean, sure. In terms of producing. Absolutely. Right. I mean, right, this right, right. is my play in that I it feels like my child. Like, I feel like I I'm going through childbirth at the moment. Um, but Sounds painful. it's, yeah, it's like painful. <laughs> I was joking with Kira. I was like, it's really painful. And we're like, never again. And then two years we'd be like, honey, you want to have another one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> that's a really good analogy. Actually. Yeah. I think that's how I feel about TV shows. When I've worked on first seasons of stuff, it's always like, this is like a fucking nightmare. Let's just go back to working on shows that have been on for 28 seasons, like Dancing with the Stars and shit. And then it rolls around and they're like, you want to do season two? And I'm like, yeah, I do. That's, that's fucking dope. It'll be easier this time, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, uh, so talk to me about working with your dad. Yeah. Um, it hasn't, we haven't gotten him in rehearsals yet. He's actually coming this Thursday. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it was really fun casting him in the part. Um, last time we did it, we had the wonderful Michael Johnson in the part. Mm-hmm. And since we're doing a professional production, I now wanted to just cast age appropriately. Right. Um, so uh, I knew I wanted an older actor. And then 
as I was thinking, like, what are who are older actors that I know? Um, my dad and I have always wanted to act together. We haven't yet had that opportunity, but I thought a good first step would be me directing him in a play. Um, is that so I, what is that like? I mean, you got to tell your boss, your dad around. I know you haven't really gotten to it yet, but how are you thinking? And how are you thinking about adding him in after you've been working with the boys and being like, all right, dad, go over there because I said so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm excited. I mean, he really believes in me. Um, it feels cheesy to say, but yeah, I mean, he hey, really that's w- not true for everybody. So that's fucking really great, actually. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he really believes in me. And he really believes in my directing. And he was very encouraging, um, even just back to Godspell. And I remember mm-hmm. him saying, you know, like, Emma, I feel like you've really got some talent here. Like, don't just let this directing thing go away. Like, there's something to this for you. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I feel like um, he definitely respects me, and so it'll be interesting. I mean, I don't know. We'll see how it goes, but um, yeah, I might we, have to check in with you after the fact, right? Yeah, and I'm like, oh my god, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited. I mean, he's he was there for the we skyped him in for the first read through, mm-hmm. um, and he's just so good. He's so talented, and like I was just like, oh yeah, that's Uncle Freddie. Oh, for um, sure. And, yeah, and I'm excited to see him and Will work together because I think they look kind of similar. And my dad is such a fan of Will. Every time he'd come to school, he would just be like, "So, how's Will doing?" Right. <laughs> um, and so I'm really excited to see the two of them together. I know Will is excited as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, he just really loves the play. And um, yeah, I'm excited to work with him. How many years apart were you guys at school? Because we should tell people who are listening, even though we will have your uh, wonderful, talented father on the show tomorrow, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that he did make you a legacy at School of the Arts. You guys are both alumni, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he graduated in 1981. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So pretty yeah, big yeah. gap. I feel like yeah. you were also at school at a time when a lot of legacy kids were there. It yeah, was like kind of a weird deluge mm-hmm. of like, it was like you and Mary Kate Harris and Gus Halper mm-hmm. and like yeah. countless Emma people. Gear. Emma Gear. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's what's so crazy because Emma Gear Lucas. and Gus, uh, yeah, and Lucas, um, I remember we went to some function where they called us out and it was like me and Gus and Emma. And then lo and behold, Emma is one of my closest friends now and she and Gus are dating and that's right. just a fun full circle. And you started dating Mary Kate, right? So it's all full exactly. circle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, that was a joke for people who aren't as inside as we are. Sorry to get a little inside baseball there. <laughs> but who's listening to this who doesn't know any of these people? Come on. Yeah. Um, no, I, I really think it's super cool that you guys are doing this and, and the people that are involved. I I was telling, and this will this will be kind of one of my last questions because I'm, I'm just very interested in this in general. I find it I find it really interesting to be in a position where you are trying to convince people to come see your play. It is a thing that we don't talk about. I don't feel like enough at School of the Arts about what it's like um, because of the the age we're living in as far as content and media that's out there. You, to make the comparison, you tell somebody, hey, I went and saw this movie. It was great. Go check it out. That's all we need to hear, and we probably might go check out that movie. Like, that's mm-hmm. all we really need to know. But to get someone to come see your fucking play, right? <laughs> the knowing laughter. Yeah. is uphill. There's mm-hmm. something about it. It's not much longer. It's not much more expensive, especially in these day and days. I mean, how much, what play that's not on Broadway costs more than a fucking $20 Marvel ticket? Like, that shit's gotten where they're about the same. So, mm-hmm. but to get, you know, people from Washington Heights to come out to Brooklyn mm-hmm. to see your fucking play, you have to make a compelling argument to them about why it's worth their time for whatever reason there's some resistance there. It's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I do less theater and more TV now because I get really worn out from like begging people to participate in my art. Um, so people who are having to kind of play that game, they are having to do the crowdfunding that you guys have really impressively pulled off. They are having, absolutely, I was super impressed. And I, like I said to Kira, I gave money to it because it was for one production with people that I knew that I knew was going to be good and that later... Not that it always has to be good for me to give money to it, but I I knew that the people involved would fucking crush it. Like, I just knew it would be great because I'd already seen it and it was good. And I was like, they're five years older. They're only going to get fucking better at this shit. No. So, but it wasn't a crowdfunding thing for like, hey, we're starting a company. Throw in on our company. It was, listen, we're doing one production. This is what we need the money for. This is what we're going to do. And then it's over. And you guys should keep doing shit. But like... 
the fact that it was a one-off thing that I believed in, I'd see it. You know what I mean? Like over maybe other stuff that's come down my feed that's like, this is going on in New York, come see our play. There was Mm. something about the combination of knowing and liking the play, but knowing that you guys were involved in it and that it wasn't the beginning of some lifelong 10-year, 15, 20-year endeavor to start some new company with some special mission statement. You're like, look, we just love this play. We think everyone should see it. That's why we're doing it. I was like, that argument sells to me. And I don't even (laughs) live there. I can't even see it. So I'm like, (laughs) word. Um, so long question, but short version is what has it been like for you making the case to people of like, come see this play. And not only that, if you saw it at school of the arts in 2015, fucking come see it again. Like it's better. (laughs) It's going to be better. Um, what has that experience been like for you, both from the fundraising to the actual, like getting butts in seats and selling tickets? Totally. Um, it's a really good question. I mean, I think we're still in that process. And so, it's been interesting. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I hope we're doing a good job. I hope people, I hope it's working. Um, I mean, for me personally, one thing I've really learned, even just from the fundraising is, um, it was, I mean, it was really scary. I think honestly, this has been one of the scariest things I've ever done because it feels really vulnerable asking for help and not just for help, but for help for myself and to say, Hey, this is something that I really believe in that I think is really good support us and the thing that's gotten me through that is just focusing on like attraction rather than promotion um like what do you mean by that that's very interesting to me like um i guess just trying to keep the focus on myself and on the play and just sharing from a place of i really love this play and i really love these people then like hey you should do this we need you to do this blah 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 blah. um I think that's what I was just communicating that I sensed from you. No, you know what I mean? Like, I think that I don't mean you're copying what I said. I mean, legit, it sounds like you're sharing the perspective that I somehow picked up on from a fucking GoFundMe page. Oh, cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, I got the sense of like, you don't want me to do anything. You don't, you, you know, you said it better than I can, which is just like you believe in the play and you think the play has merit. And I happen to know that you're right because I've seen it and read it. And so... Yeah, that that's that that makes sense. It's that came across in the way that you you did the crowdfunding, uh, oh. that sensibility, and that's what sold me. Thank you. Yeah, so I think oh. if you continue on that track, you know, you take everything I say with a giant grain of salt. But <laughs> but my advice would be, sell everything you ever do that way, because there was a sincerity in the way that it was coming across for me. That again, I can't even articulate as well as you did, which is like. I want to give my funding, my support, my, you know, I'm doing this with you guys, not just because it also helps with the show, but because it feels like we're both doing the thing that we're doing because we fucking like doing it and it's fun and we think it brings value to people and it's really not more complicated than that. Yeah, it's very simple. Um, And I think the more I focus on that, the happier I am. Because when it starts feeling like super promoty or like, hey, like we need this, it feels, it did, I don't know, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't feel fun. And when I keep the focus on just, I love this play and it's mm-hmm. a really good play and it needs to be told. And I also like that we're giving some money to Ali Forney, which is um, just an organization. Like I, I hey, Can like you tell me some more about that? We haven't talked about that really. Yeah. Um, so we're giving $2 of every ticket sale to the Ali Forney Center. Um, and the Ali Forney Center is a New York-based organization. Um, it was started and Ali Forney was a gender nonconforming youth who was murdered. And um, so in their name, they had now have this organization that helps LGBTQ um, plus youths who are struggling with homelessness, helping them get jobs, helping mm-hmm. them be rehabilitated into the community. Um, and I, I just like that. I feel like in this day and age, there, there's so much scary stuff going on. And I often get really overwhelmed and I feel powerless and like, what can I really do? And while, yes, I think this play can change people and there's a big emotional release and there's a sense of you get a lot of just feelings out, if, for lack for a better phrase. Yeah. Um, I feel I like having something tangible that can really help people. Um, So that feels good. And um, yeah. (laughs) Well, and and, no, it's great. And and contributing to something like that, even just telling me about the fact that that organization exists right now, you've spread the word and increased the awareness for 
stories that are not often told, which is, of course, the whole point of Bent is this is another side of a thing we talk about all the time, even now, for good reason. But this side of it is not always addressed. And, you know, one of the things that maybe people don't realize as they hear you say that is that the the community that you're talking about and I man I, when I was in high school living in New York City I used to go down to 14th Street and Union and just like hang out in that area where you get to know and there's all these kids and there's a huge part of uh LBGT uh Q+ plus, all you know th- that that's a big part of that community that's kind of out there and you're sitting there hanging out with a couple of your buddies from high school and maybe a couple of their friends from Brooklyn and then a couple other people and then in, in the course of you guys all hanging out two of those people let you know that yeah, they they live here, you know, and you didn't you couldn't tell them apart from anybody else who you're hanging out and chilling with. And everybody seems cool. And you just assume they're going to go home to their families. And unfortunately, there is a very large portion of the community. They come out and then there's no home for them because they are not accepted by home. And uh, they often end up on the streets, uh, you know, trying to figure that out and, and pulling that and to know that that specific you know, of the 500,000 Americans who sleep on the street every single night, it is disproportionately minorities, either either racial minorities or, uh, you know, LBGTQ. Like, it is the pushed out people who end up in these desperate situations. And we so often, you know, don't just don't highlight that that's part of it. And I love that you guys are doing that. I love that this show does that in so many ways. Um, and truthfully, I, I I don't know. I The more I talk to you guys about it, the more I'm glad it's happening, the more I'm glad I'm supporting it. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm just, you know, telling everybody who's listening now, like, this was worth it. It was great. Like, you know, it sounds a little bit like that. But I'm, I'm further inspired with each conversation only because I feel like, you know, plays can be done for lots of different reasons. And it just seems like all of your hearts are really in the right place in doing this. And, you know, there's there's nothing self-gratifying or self, you know, even sustaining for you to leave Atlanta and San Diego to go to New York City and Brooklyn and do a fucking Holocaust play in the winter that ends not great for everybody in the story so it's like you know these these kids aren't doing this show because it's it's a fun romp in the park you know it's it's work it's hard work it's taxing exhausting work to do this play and i think that if people really grasp what you guys are going through to do it period it's like oh well maybe i should take the time at least to you know a couple hours of my day to go check out what they seem to care so much about to put themselves through I don't know if I've articulated that well as someone who's not in the show, but maybe that's on, maybe that's close. I would agree. Yeah. And I mean, it's fun. That's one thing we're finding so much in the play is yes, it's the Holocaust and yes, it ends horribly, but there's so much humor in it and there's so much hope in it. And it's also really sexy. Like we've definitely been finding there's a lot of really sexy, sexually charged moments and, um, there's even nudity in the beginning. And so I feel like from the middle, the moment that happens, it's just kind of like, whoa. Um, but in yeah. a good way, like it's, um, it's very full of life. I feel like there's tragedy and there's heartbreak and there's a lot of violence. Right. And, um, but there's also a lot of love and, um, and like sexual love, but loving love. And, uh, yeah, I just feel like it, it has the whole scope of human existence in a play. And I think that really, really does. Like, that's what's truly powerful about it is, I mean, I don't, and, and, and I, I want to be clear if by chance someone's just listening to this one interview, first of all, go listen to the rest of them. But also, you know, because we, we did a good job of this, what I'm about to say in some of the other episodes, which I want to do on our way out here, which is to highlight, this is not crying for two hours. This is not mm-hmm. a, a one stroke play where it's just like downhill, sad, 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 sad. <laughs> that's not what the fuck it is. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, other people have categorized it, which I think is appropriate. It kind of starts like a rom-com. That's what it feels oh, yeah. like. Mm-hmm. And it is deeply funny. It is deeply sexy. It is uh, 
all those things. Um, so make sure to, you know, not scare anybody off with all our sad Holocaust talk that we've had. But that's what that's what's amazing about the play is that it is all those things. It's not just yeah. one. Totally. You are directing a play that explores mostly male themes uh, and mostly male same sex themes. Uh, you are approaching this as a female. What's that like for you? Um, it's really interesting. I mean, um, for some reason, most of my favorite plays, um, are all male plays Mm. like blood knot and of mice and men are my two favorite plays. Those are fucking Um, great plays. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. It's not like, um, I don't feel like there's a particular reason why I'm drawn to this, but I also in like a strange way, I think I almost have enough distance from it since Mm -hmm. it's not my personal experience that I find to be kind of useful. Um, And I feel like that kind of, I noticed that with like Bo Burnham's 13. That's what it's called, right? 13? Uh, I think it's called eighth grade. Eighth grade. Yes. Yeah. Eighth grade. Um, Where I thought that was interesting where it's like a young girl's experience and here's Mm -hmm. this like man telling it. And I think there's something in like it not being my experience that's helps me see it from the outside um I think um I don't really know what else to say about it I guess uh I mean it just kind of is what it is and I think that makes a lot of sense having that outside perspective I I honestly it's been a minute but uh since I've directed a play but I connect way more with directing female characters and specifically people who are going through things that I I mean I did how I learned to drive for my final that is a yeah. fucking chicks play. Like that is a play about chicks, kind of for chicks, and the only dudes in it are awful, except for the <laughs> except for the uncle who's like both awful and great. And so yeah. it's like, yeah, I don't know. There's, I think what it is, and may, I don't know if this is part of it to you as well. When I'm working on a piece of material that feels like it's about people that I'm not, it mm. incites my curiosity to understand them. And when we were working on How I Learned to Drive, for example, talking to Becca and Adelaide and uh, Ellie about their experiences growing up as women was like, first of all, they end up directing a lot of the play because they're mm-hmm. contributing things I don't, I can't speak on. But I learned so much more asking people who are not me, who don't live life like I do, how do you deal with this shit? How do you get through this kind of difficulty, Uh, you know, and it's almost part of the fun of it is like I get to dive into this world that I don't know anything about. Um, Whereas if, you know, at a bunch of like uh, sexually confused white boys from Texas, the play, I would be like, "Mm, I don't know if this is fun, you know, I feel like (laughs) I get it. I feel like we've explored. (laughs) I've explored everything I might need to know about it. Um, I don't know. That's for part of it. That's, that's for me. I don't know if that's for you at all. Yeah. I relate to that. Of um, yeah, I feel, I, I've, I don't know. I think I've just learned so much about this play and also, um, just gay culture at the time. And then right. compared to gay culture now. And, um, I feel like I've been on the outskirts of it just because of having a lot of gay friends and, um, friends that do drag and things like that. Um, so I feel a little bit of an outsider, but at the same time, um, I don't know. I just, I can't, I'm not a man, but um, I like my sexuality isn't like black and white either. And right. so I feel like, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I feel like for me, this story is so much more about people than gender, I guess. Yeah. Well, so, any really good story has a healthy dose of universality, right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm really, really proud of you, and I'm proud of all you guys for pulling this off. It's a hard fucking play to do. It's hard to do a play on your own in these days, uh, especially, you know, out in Brooklyn and getting all the money together and all this shit. So, Godspeed. I'm really excited for you guys. I think it's going to be really fucking good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. (laughs) 